This is Charles Bukowski. <laughs> well, just let me sit here and drink beer. What was it? I heard Cage one time, he got on the stage and they uh, just stood there and he ate an apple and he walked off and got a thousand dollars. I'll just drink this, I'll drink this beer and I'll leave, right? <laughs> okay, let's forget the bullshit. <clears throat> Get into the so-called art. This keeps up, I may have all you guys off the shit. <clears throat> I don't know if you guys know about horse racing. Okay. I'm glad you let that sentence go on. The creation of the morning line. The morning line runs about thus. Cliché, six to five. Originality, five to two. Treachery, four. Hope, six. Malfunction, six. History, eight. Medicine, 10. Syphilis, 12. Kindness, 15. Law, 20. Crime, 20. Population, 30. Love, 50. Forget overlay. Love never won yet, since platitude was an overnight scratch. If you can get three to five on cliché, put down everything you've got. <clears throat> this is not a prop, it's a necessity. I'll give you my next poem, Death. Look, he said, you've got spider traps all along this wall. It's fascinating. He was outside my door, peering at the stucco wall. I said, come on in. He said, no, wait. And he got a twig and found some ants. And he said, Bukowski, I'm going to make this ant run the gauntlet. The phone rang and I answered the phone. And all I was talking and listening, he said, Bukowski, he got away from the first spider. Now the second one is out and he's got the ant by the rear legs. Listen, Linda, I said, I've got a visitor and also my toilet stopped and the shit is coming up through the tub. <laughs> Bukowski, he said, now the spider is throwing a net over him. He's weaving around and around. Now he's moving in, Bukowski. Now he's got him. Death! The landlord came in. It'll take a little while to clear it up, he said. He was talking about the ship. All right, I said. Linda, I said. Shit and death is everywhere. <laughs> I'll call you back, she said. <clears throat> now I've got a spider, said my visitor, and I'm giving him to the ant. I walked outside. For Christ's sake, kid, will you stop playing this spider ant game? Let's go for a ride. The landlord gets very nervous when he plays with the plumbing. <laughs> Look, he said, the ants are chopping the spider's legs off one by one. Good strategy, I said, let's go. 
We drove down to Norm's and had breakfast. My friend commented continually on humanity. He didn't think they were much. I didn't argue. My friend was a great admirer of Ernest Hemingway. I drove him to Hollywood and Normandy and let him out. <laughs> when I got back, the shit was still in the tub. I didn't want to take a bath anyway. The sex fiends. We all are. <laughs> God. The sex fiends. I go to this rehabilitation center with my sister, he said. And the sex fiends all sit together. They're all guys five feet tall or under. And this one guy, they call him the rabbit. Well, the rabbit's problem is that he propositions every woman he sees. He just walks up and asks them to go to bed with him. I think that's very honest, I said. <laughs> Some very greasy characters use the roundabout approach. Maybe so, he said, but it's still gotten the rabbit into trouble. In fact, he said, the rabbit saw a woman at the center and he walked up to her and said, will you go to bed with me? And the woman said no, and the rabbit said, I'll give you a dollar. <laughs> then, all the sex fiends went into this room to masturbate. And the rabbit was working away when the therapist walked in and he tried to rape her. Yeah, yeah, what happened? Oh, she just pushed him off and walked out. By the way, I asked, what were you doing there? Oh, he said, I'm a sex fiend. I go every Thursday morning at 8 a.m. Do you want to come with me next week? I ought to, I said, but I like to sleep late in the morning. I heard somebody say, funky old guy, you know, don't you think that's a little outworn expression? Not old guy, but the other part, funky. I mean, we ought to drop that funky, you know, like groovy, you know, like, God, I'm getting nasty now, I had a couple beers, I'm trying to, yeah, <laughs> God. I'll be ridiculous before this thing is over, you, you really like Am I getting ridiculous? Okay. Not yet. Not yet. I'm working on it. All right. Love. Love, he said. Gas. Kiss me off. Kiss my lips. Kiss my hair, my fingers, my cock, my balls, my eyes, my brain. Make me forget. Love, he said, gas. And he had a room on the third floor, rejected by a dozen women, 35 editors, and a half a dozen hiring agencies. Now, I'm not saying he was any good. <coughs> gas. He turned on all the jets without lighting them, and went to bed. 
Some hours later, a guy on his way to room 309 lit a cigar in the hall. And sofas flew out the window. One wall shivered down like wet sand. A purple flame weighed 40 feet high in the air. The guy in bed didn't know or care. But I'd have to say he was pretty good that day. Listen, some of these poems are serious. And I have to apologize for those because I know most crowds don't like serious poems. But I've got to give you a thumb now and then to show that I'm really not a beer drinking machine. Yeah, okay. I'm begging the question. Forget it. Now we'll get back to the standard hard bullshit. <laughs> Piss and shit. Mm. Sometimes, like now, I think of D.H. Lawrence taking a piss. <laughs> now that would hardly be an ordinary piss, would it? I mean, D.H. was really such a snob, you know. For it all, his writing stank of it. I don't mean piss, I mean snobbery, piss snobbery. It's an old trick, writing of life as if you really had an angle on it. I do it myself. I even admire my own piss while I'm pissing. But I really like my writing better than his. Piss and writing, we're closest to our own. I heard that. As far as shit goes, I'd have to refer you to Balzac, with Tolstoy in the ante room, and Chaucer stank a bit too. But as far as shit goes, well, you know, Lawrence, he had the dignified piss. He painted it. They fined him for it, I'm told, for hanging it in the galleries. But as for shit, I tell you fellows, Balzac had it all. Is that pronounced properly? I'm one of these uneducated minnows of the ages. The death of an idiot. He spoke to mice and sparrows and his hair was white at the age of 16. His father beat him every day, and his mother lit candles in the church. He seemed to be constantly masturbating in such odd places as behind the garage or up in the apricot tree. His grandmother came while the boy slept and prayed for the devil to let loose his hold upon him while his mother listened and cried over the Bible. The young girls he didn't seem to notice. The games boys played he didn't seem to notice. There wasn't much he seemed to notice. He just didn't seem interested. He had a very large and ugly mouth and the teeth bent out and his eyes were small and lusterless. His shoulders were slumped and his back was bent like an old man. He lived in our neighborhood. We talked about him a bit when we got bored and then went on to more interesting things. He seldom left his house. We would have liked to beat him, but his father, who was a huge and terrible man, beat him for us. One day the boy died. At 17, he was still a boy. 
A death in a small neighborhood is noted with alacrity and forgotten three or four days later. But the death of this boy seemed to stay with us all. We kept talking about it in our boy man's voices at 6 p.m. just before dark, just before dinner. And whenever I drive through that neighborhood now, decades later, I think of his death while having forgotten all the other deaths or anything else that had happened then. As I say, can't all be sex, can it? Style. Style is the answer to everything. A fresh way to approach a dull or dangerous thing. To do a dull thing with style is preferable to doing a dangerous thing without it. To do a dangerous thing with style is what I call art. Bullfighting can be an art. Boxing can be an art. Loving can be an art. Opening a can of sardines can be an art. Not many have style. Not many can keep style. I have seen dogs with more style than men, although not many dogs have style. <laughs> Cats have it with abundance. When Hemingway put his brains to the wall with a shotgun, that was style. Or sometimes people give you style. Joan of Arc had style. John the Baptist, Christ, Socrates, Caesar, Garcia Lorca. I've met men in jail with style. I've met more men in jail with style than men out of jail. Style is a different, a way of doing, a way of being done. Six herons standing quietly in a pool of water, or you walking out of the bathroom naked without seeing me. Do I know you? <laughs> Don't push me around, baby. I'll, I'll deck. Never mind. <laughs> One more beer. I'll take you all, all of you. <laughs> Watch out. <laughs> okay, okay. I've been lifting weights. <laughs> what the hell you want, man? Get away from me. <laughs> Are you some kind of freak? Or... <laughs> uh -oh. oh, I did it. Oh, uh, shit. I knew. Okay, I want you to hate me anyhow. How many beers can I drink without falling down? Blanket? You guys are drunker than I am. What the hell? <laughs> okay, let's go. Come on. Let's get the job done. Let's collect our money and get the hell out of here and really make it. <laughs> okay, you're right. <laughs> you want some poems? Beg me. <laughs> okay. Law. Look, he told me. 
all those little children dying in the trees. And I said, what? And he said, look. And I went to the window, and sure enough, here they were hanging in the trees, dead and dying. And I said, what does it mean? And he said, I don't know. It's authorized. The next day I got up and they had dogs in the trees, dead and hanging and dying. And I turned to my friend and I said, what does it mean? And he said, don't worry about it. It's a way of things. They took a vote. It was decided. And the next day it was cats. I don't see how they caught all those cats so fast and hung them in the trees, but they did. And the next day it was horses. And that wasn't so good because many branches broke. <laughs> Branches broke. <laughs> and after bacon and eggs the next day, my friend pulled his pistol on me across the coffee and said, let's go. And we went outside. And here were all these men and women in the trees, most of them dead or dying. And he got the rope ready, and I said, what does it mean? And he said, it's authorized, constitutional. It passed the majority. And he tied my hands behind my back, then opened the news. I don't know who's going to hang me, he said, when I get done with you. I suppose when it finally works down, there'll be just one left and he'll have to hang himself. Suppose he doesn't, I asked. He has to, he said. It's authorized. Oh, I said, well, let's get on with it. <clears throat> all right, all right. This one's called... Uh, my friend Andre, this kid used to teach at Kansas U. Then they moved him out. He went to a bean factory. Then he and his wife moved to the coast. She got a job and worked a while. He looked for a job as an actor. I really want to be an actor, he told me. That's all I want to be. That's the way he talks. This is not in the poem. <laughs> right, Linda? <laughs> he came by with his wife. He came by alone. The streets around here are full of guys who want to be actors. I saw him yesterday. He was rolling cigarettes. I poured him some white wine. My wife is getting tired of waiting, he said. I'm going to teach karate. His hands were all swollen from hitting them against bricks and walls and doors. He told me about some of the great oriental fighters. There was one guy got so good, he could turn his head 180 degrees to see who was behind him. That's very hard to do, he said. <laughs> it's more difficult to fight four men properly placed than to fight many more. When you have many more, they get in each other's way, and a good fighter who has much strength and agility can do well. Some of the great fighters, he said, even attempt to suck their balls into their bodies. This can be done to some extent because there are natural cavities in the body. If you stand upside down, you will notice this. I gave him a little more white wine. Then he left. You know, sometimes making it with a typewriter isn't so painful after all. <laughs> mm. 
Thank you. The best love poem I can write at the moment. Listen, I told her, why don't you stick your tongue up my ass? No, she said. Well, I said, if I stick my tongue up your ass first, then will you stick your tongue up my ass? All right, she said. I got my head down there and looked around. Opened a section, then my tongue moved forward. Not there, she said. <laughs> not there, that's not the right place. You women have more holes than Swiss cheese. <laughs> I don't want you to do it. Why? Well, then I'll have to do it back, and then at the next party you'll tell people I licked your ass with my tongue. Suppose I promise not to tell. You'll get drunk. You'll tell. <laughs> okay, I said. Roll over. I'll stick it in the other place. She rolled over, and I stuck my tongue in that other place. We were in love. <laughs> we were in love with, pardon, we were in love except with what I said at parties. And we were not in love with each other's assholes. She wants me to write a love poem, but I think if people can't love each other's assholes, and farts, and shits, and terrible parts, just like they love the good parts, that ain't complete love. So, as far as love poems go, as far as we have gone, this poem will have to do. <laughs> the World's Greatest Loser he used to sell papers in front. Get your winners, get rich on a dime. And about the third or fourth race, you'd see him rolling on his rotten board with his roller skates underneath. He'd propel himself along on his hands. He just had small stumps for legs. And the rims of the skate wheels were worn off. You could see inside the wheels and they would wobble something awful, shooting and flashing imperialistic sparks. He moved faster than anybody. Rolled cigarette dangling, you could hear him coming. God almighty, what was that, the new ones asked. He was the world's greatest loser, but he never gave up, wheeling toward the two-dollar window, screaming, It's the four horse, you fools! How the hell are you going to beat the four? Up on the board, the four would be reading 60 to 1. I never heard him pick a winner. They say he slept in the bushes. I guess that's where he died. He's not around anymore. There was a big fat blonde who kept touching him for luck and laughing. Nobody had any luck. 
the horror is gone too. I guess nothing ever works for us. We're fools, of course. Bucking the inside plus a 15% take. How are you going to tell a dreamer when it's a 15% take on the dream? He'll just laugh and say, is that all? I miss those sparks. God, all you guys belching and puking. What kind of audience is this? That's good. I, okay. Read on, Charles. What do you teach English Lit to? <laughs> Listen, before this thing's over, I'll come down to the audience and clean out all you babies. I'm a tough son of a bitch. All right. I brought my own shit. I'm reading it. Mm -hmm. All right, lots of you guys hate me, let me go on. The last days of the suicide kid. Any other comments? The last days of the suicide kid. I can see myself now, after all these suicide days and nights, being wheeled out of one of these sterile rest homes. Of course, this is only if I get famous and lucky by a subnormal and bored nurse. There I am sitting upright in my wheelchair, almost blind, eyes rolling backward into the dark part of my skull looking for the mercy of death. Isn't it a lovely day, Mr. Bukowski? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the children walk past, and I don't even exist. And the lovely women walk by with big, hot hips and warm buttocks and tight, hot everything, praying to be loved, and I don't even exist. It's the first sunlight we've had in three days, Mr. Bukowski. Oh, yeah, yeah. And there I am, sitting upright in my wheelchair, myself whiter than a sheet of paper, bloodless, brain gone, gamble gone, me, Bukowski gone. This is a lovely day, Mr. Bukowski. Oh, yeah, yeah. Kissing in my pajamas, flop drooling out of my mouth. Two young schoolboys run by. Hey, did you see that old guy? Christ, yes, he makes me sick. <laughs> After all the threats to do so, somebody else has committed suicide for me. At last. The nurse stops the wheelchair. Breaks a rose from a nearby bush, puts it in my hand. I don't even know what it is. It might as well be my pecker for all the good it does. Of course, that's never going to happen, you know. <laughs> The shower. We like to shower afterwards. I like the water hotter than she. And her face is always soft and peaceful. And she'll wash me first. Spread the soap over my balls. Lift the balls. Squeeze them. Then wash the cup. Hey, this thing is still hard. Then get all the hair down there, the belly, the back, 
the neck, the legs. I grin, grin, grin. And then I wash her. First the cunt. I stand behind her, my cock in the cheeks of her ass. I gently soap up the cunt hairs, wash there with a soothing motion. I linger perhaps longer than necessary. <laughs> then I get the backs of the legs, the ass, the back, the neck. I turn her, kiss her, soap up the breasts, get them in the belly, the neck, the front of the legs, the ankles, the feet, and then the cunt once more for luck. Another kiss, and she gets out first, howling, sometimes singing while I, while I stay in. God, I missed the line. Turn the water on hotter, feeling the good times of love's miracle. Then I get out. It is usually mid-afternoon and quiet, and getting dressed, we talk about what else there might be to do. But being together solves most of it, in fact, solves all of it. For as long as those things stay solved in the history of woman and man, it's different for each and better and worse for each. For me, it's splendid enough to remember past the marching of armies and the horses that walk the streets outside, past the memories of pain and defeat and unhappiness. Linda, she brought it to me. When you take it away, do it slowly and easily. Make it as if I were dying in my sleep instead of my death. Well, I'm sorry. Oh. Hot. She was hot. She was so hot, I didn't want anybody else to have her. Now, if I didn't get home on time, she'd be gone. I couldn't bear that. I went mad. It was foolish, I know, childish. But I was caught in it. I was caught. I delivered all the mail, and then Henderson put me on the night pickup run in an old army truck. The damn thing began to heat halfway through the run, and the night went on. Me thinking of my hot Miriam, and jumping in out of the truck, filling mail sacks. The engine continued to heat up. The temperature needle was at the end, hot, hot like Miriam. I leaped in and out. Three more pickups and into the station I'd be. My car went in to get to Miriam, who sat on my blue couch with scotch on the rocks and crossing her legs and kicking her ankles like she did. Two more stops. The truck stalled at a traffic light. It was all hell kicking it over again. I had to be home at eight. Eight was the deadline for Miriam. I made the last pickup and the truck stalled at a signal one half block from the station. It wouldn't start, it couldn't start. I locked the doors, pulled the key and ran down to the station. I threw the keys down, signed out. Your goddamn truck is stalled at the signal, Pico and Western. <laughs> I ran down the hall, put the key into the door, opened it. Her drinking glass was there and a note on the dresser. Son of a bitch. I waited until five after eight. You don't love me, you son of a bitch. Somebody will love me. I've been waiting all day. Miriam. I poured a drink and let the water run into the tub. 
There were 5,000 bars in town, and I'd make 25 of them looking for Miriam. Her purple teddy bear held the note as he leaned against the pillow. I gave the bear a drink, myself a drink, and got into the hot water. Earthquake. Americans don't know what tragedy is. A little 6.5 earthquake can set them to chattering like monkeys. A piece of chinaware broken. The Union Rescue Mission falls down. 6 a.m. They sit in their cars. They're all driving around. Where are they going? A little excitement has broken into their canned lives. Pardon. Stranger stands next to stranger, chattering gibberish fear, anxious fear, anxious laughter. My baby, my flower pots, my ceiling, my bank account. This is just a tickler, a feather, and they can't bear it. Suppose they bombed the city as other cities have been bombed. Not with an A-bomb, but with ordinary blockbusters day after day, every day, as has happened in other cities of the world. If the rest of the world could see you today, their laughter would bring the sun to its knees, and even the flowers would leap from the ground like bulldogs and chase you away to where you belong, wherever that is, and who cares where it is, as long as it's somewhere away from here. <laughs> Listen, will you let me read this shit and just be quiet? The rat. With one punch, at the age of 16 and a half, I knocked out my father, a cruel, shiny bastard with bad breath. And I didn't go home for some time, only now and then to try to get a dollar from dear mama. It was 1937 in Los Angeles, and it was a hell of a Vienna. I ran with these older guys, but for them it was the same, mostly breathing hard air and robbing gas stations that didn't have any money, and a few lucky among us worked part-time as Western Union messenger boys. We slept in rented rooms that weren't rented, and we drank ale and wine with the shades down, being quiet, quiet and then awakening the whole building with a fist fight, breaking mirrors and chairs and lamps, and then running down the stairway just before the police arrived. Some of us soldiers of the future, running through those empty, starving streets and alleys of Los Angeles, and all of us getting together later in Pete's room, a small cube of space under a stairway, there we were, packed in there, without women, without cigarettes, without anything to drink, while the rich pawed away at their many choices, and the young girls left them, the same girls who spit at our shadows as we walked past. It was a hell of a Vienna. Three of us under that stairway were killed in World War II. Another one is now a manager of a mattress factory. Me? I'm 30 years older. The town is four or five times as big, but just as rotten. And the girls still spit on my shadow. Another war is building for another reason. I can hardly get a job now for the same reason I couldn't then. I don't know anything. I can't do anything. 
sex? Well, just the old ones knock on my door after midnight. I can't sleep, and they see the lights and are curious. The old ones, their husbands no longer want them. Their children are gone. If they show me enough good leg, the legs go last. I go to bed with them. So the old women bring me love, and I smoke their cigarettes as they talk, talk, talk. And then we go to bed again, and I bring them love. And they feel good and talk until the sun comes up. Then we sleep. It's a hell of a Paris. Once upon a time, a guy called Dylan Thomas was destroyed by poetry audiences. And sit your asses down, I'm going to destroy you instead of you destroying me. By the way, is Linda King in the audience tonight? Would she stand up? This is the woman I love. Linda? Where are you? There she is. Most beautiful woman in the world. Thank you, Linda. Okay, let's go on with the... That's Linda clapping now. <laughs> let's go on with it. This is called The Shoelace. A woman, a tire that slaps, a disease, a desire, fears in front of you, fears that hold so still you can study them like pieces on a chessboard. It's not the large things that send a man to a madhouse. Death he's ready for, or murder, incest, robbery, fire, Love. No, it's a continuing series of small tragedies that send a man to the madhouse. Not the death of his love, but a shoelace that snaps with no time left. The dread of life is that swarm of trivialities that can kill quicker than cancer and which are always there license plates, or taxes, or expired driver's license, or hiring, or firing, doing it, or having it done to you, or constipation, speeding tickets, rickets, or crickets, or mice, or termites, or roaches, or flies, or a broken hook on a screen, or out of gas, or too much gas. The sink stopped up, the landlord's drunk, the president doesn't care, and the, and the governor's crazy. Light switch broken, mattress like a porcupine, $105 for a tune-up, carburetor and fuel pump at Sears Roebuck, and the phone builds up and the market's down, and the toilet chain is broken, and the light is burned out. The hall light, the front light, the back light, the inner light, it's darker than hell and twice as expensive. And there's always crabs and ingrown toenails and people who insist they're your friends. There's always that and worse. Leaky faucet, Christ and Christmas, blue salami, nine-day rains, 50-cent avocados, and purple liverwurst. Or making it as a waitress at Norm's on the split shift, or as an emptier of bedpans, or as a car wash or a bus boy, or a stealer of old ladies' purses, leaving them screaming on the sidewalks with broken arms at the age of 80. Suddenly, two red lights in your rearview mirror, and blood in your underwear, toothache, 
and nine hundred and seventy nine dollars for bridge for a bridge pardon and three hundred dollars for a gold tooth and china and russia and america and long hair and short hair and no hair and beards and no beards and faces and no faces and plenty of zigzag but no pot except maybe one to piss in and another one around your gut with each broken shoelace out of 100 broken shoelaces one man one woman one thing enters a madhouse so be careful when you bend over Okay, here's one nobody's ever liked, so I'll read it. <laughs> Eighteen cars full of men thinking of what could have been. Driving in from the track, I saw a woman in green, all rump and breast and dizziness running across the street. She was as sexy as a green and drunken antelope. And when she got to the curbing, she tripped and fell down and sat in the gutter. I sat there in my car looking at her, and oddly, I felt most impassive, of impassive, as if nothing had happened. And I sat there, I sat there looking at this green creature until a moving van 60 feet long came to a stop and helped the lady up. A young man in white overalls, flushed red, and the girl was built all around, all around, and stupid with falling, and stupid with life, and swaying on the tower stilts of her high heels. She stood there rubbing her white knees, and the young man kept talking to her. He was big, dumb, blonde, pink, and lonely. But then the woman asked him where the nearest bar was, and he grinned and pointed down the street and gave it up. He got back into the truck, 60 feet full of furniture and blanket and stove, pulled down down the, the street, and the green antelope crossed the street toward the bar, wobbling and shaking, shaking and wobbling, everything. And we sat transfixed and watching until into the backed up traffic behind me, a man of strength honked, honked. <laughs> he honked several times. And I put the thing in drive, slowing for the big dip by the market that could tear your car in half. And they all followed me, slowing for the dip too. Eighteen cars full of men, thinking of what could have been, about the one who got away. It was sunset and heavy traffic and heavy life. Listen, I don't know what else to do with you guys. I mean, I'm, I... Let's call it quits, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's all do the thing now, you know. I report upon the consumption of myself. 
I'm a panther corked out and bellowing in cement walls. And I'm angry at blue evenings without ventilators. And I'm angry with you, and it will come like a rose. It will come like a man walking through fire. It will shine like an unseen trumpet in a trunk. The eyes will smell like sausages. The feet will have small propellers. And I will hold you in Bayonne, and the sailors will smile. And my heart, like something cut away from cancer, will feel and beat again, feel and beat again. But now the blue evening is sensed like old muskets and the dangling sex rope hangs as a tree stands up and calls July. And the dust of hope in the bottom of paper cups along with small spiders that have names like ancient European cities. Cuckoo spit and dross, heavy wheels. Oil wells stuck between fish and sucking up gray gas of love and the palms up on the cliff waving, waving in the warm yellow light as I walk into a drugstore to buy toothpaste, rubbers, photographs of frogs, a copy of the latest consumer reports, 50 cents. For I consume and am consumed and would like to know on this blue evening just which razor blade would be best for me to use. Or maybe I could get a station wagon, or buy a stereo receiver, or a movie camera, say 8mm, under $55. Or an electric frying pan, like the silver head of some god thing, after they drop the bomb, bang! And the grass gives up, and love is a shadow, and love is a fishtail waving through necks of thread that seem eyes but are only what's left of me on this last blue evening. After the bands have suicided out, the carnival has left town, and they've blown up the YWCA like a giant balloon and sent it out to sea full of screaming, lovely, lonely girls. Something for the touts, the nuns, the grocery clerks, and you. We have everything and we have nothing. And some men do it in churches. And some men do it by tearing butterflies in half. And some men do it in Palm Springs, laying it into butter blondes with Cadillac souls. Cadillacs and butterflies, nothing and everything. The face melting down to the last puff in the cellar in Corpus Christi. There's something for the touts, the nuns, the grocery clerks, and you. Something at 8 a.m., something in the library, something in the river, everything and nothing. In the slaughterhouse, it comes running along the ceiling on a hook, and you swing it. One, two, three, and then you've got it. $200 worth of dead meat. It's bones against your bones. Something and nothing. It's always early enough to die and it's always too late. And the drill of blood in the basin white, it tells you nothing at all. And the grave diggers playing poker over 5 a.m. coffee, waiting for the grass to dismiss the frost. They tell you nothing at all. We have everything and we have nothing. Days with glass edges and the impossible stink of river moss, worse than shit. Checkerboard days of moves and counter moves. Fagged interest with as much sense in defeat as in victory. Slow days like mules humping it slagged and sullen and sun glazed up a road where a madman sits waiting among blue jays and wrens netted in and sucked a flaky gray. Good days too of wine and shouting, fights in alleys, fat legs of women striven around your bowels, buried in moans, the signs and bull rings like diamonds hollering Mother Capri. Violets coming out of the ground, 
telling you to forget the dead armies and the loves that robbed you. Days when children say funny and brilliant things like savages trying to send you a message through their bodies while their bodies are still alive enough to transmit and feel and run up and down without locks and paychecks and ideals and possessions and beetle-like opinions. Days when you can cry all day long in a green room with a door locked. Days when you can laugh at the bread man because his legs are too long. Days of looking at hedges. And nothing and nothing. The days of the bosses, yellow men with bad breath and big feet. Men who look like frogs, hyenas. Men who walk as if melody had never been invented. Men who think it is intelligent to hire and fire and profit. Men with expensive wives they possess like 60 acres of ground to be drilled or shown off or to be walled away from the incompetent. Men who'd kill you because they're crazy and justify it because it's the law. Men who stand in front of windows 30 feet wide and see nothing. Men with luxury yachts who can sail around the world and yet never get out of their vest pockets. Men like snails, men like eels, men like slugs, and not as good. And nothing. Getting your last paycheck at a harbor, at a factory, at a hospital, at an aircraft plant, at a penny arcade, at a barber shop, at a job you didn't want anyway. Income tax, sickness, servility, broken arms, broken heads, all the stuffing come out like an old pillow. We have everything and we have nothing. Some do it well enough for a while and then give way. Fame gets them, or disgust, or age, or lack of proper diet, or ink across the eyes, or children in college, or new cars, or broken backs while skiing in Switzerland, or new politics, or new wives, or just natural change and decay. The man you knew yesterday hooking for ten rounds or drinking for three days and three nights by the Sawtooth Mountains. Now just something under a sheet or a cross or a stone or under an easy delusion or packing a Bible or a golf bag or a briefcase. How they go, how they go, all the ones you thought would never go. Days like this like your day today. Maybe the rain on the window trying to get through to you. What do you see today? What is it? Where are you? The best days are sometimes the first, sometimes the middle, and even sometimes the last. The vacant lots are not bad. Churches in Europe on postcards are not bad. People in wax museums frozen into their best sterility are not bad. Horrible, but not bad. The cannon. Think of the cannon. And toast for breakfast and coffee hot enough so you know your tongue is still there. Three geraniums outside a window trying to be red and trying to be pink and trying to be geraniums. No wonder sometimes the women cry. No wonder the mules don't want to go up the hill. Are you in a hotel room in Detroit looking for a cigarette? One more good day, a little bit of it. And as the nurses come out of the building after their shift, having had enough, eight nurses with different names and different places to go, walking across the lawn, some of them want cocoa and a paper. Some of them want a hot bath. Some of them want a man. Some of them are hardly thinking at all. Enough and not enough. Arcs and pilgrims, oranges, gutters, ferns, antibodies, boxes of tissue paper. In the most decent sometimes sun, there is a soft smoke feeling from urns and the canned sound of old battle planes. And if you go inside and run your finger along the window ledge, 
you'll find dirt, maybe even earth. And if you look out the window, there will be the day. And as you get older, you'll keep looking, keep looking, sucking your tongue in a little. Ah, uh, ah, uh, no, no, maybe. Some do it naturally, some obscenely, everywhere.